All right, we are recording. Okay, so weak words. This is a list of words, and you can find this at your on the teacher grade link page. Um, there's a lot of good writing resources on there. So this is our weak word list. Don't use these words. So try to avoid using these words in your writing because they're considered um, less sophisticated words, younger words, okay? So try to avoid them. How to write a strong essay body. You're gonna to have to write your body paragraphs. You just peer edited your opening paragraphs for your first essay. So we expect a lot more because you're doing essays now, not just paragraphs. So you've got to step up your writing. So we're going to watch this video about how to write good body paragraphs. Have you ever had one of those bad dreams in which everything is fuzzy, nothing makes sense, and random people and things pop up for no discernible reason? For example, maybe you dream that you're trying to get to your math test, but the directions are really vague and you can't figure out where you're going or where to turn to get to the right place. Suddenly, you're being chased through the woods by the checkout guy from the grocery store, and then you're saved by your third grade math teacher, who insists that you look at photos from a trip to Mexico. We often wake up from dreams like that that don't make sense, asking what they meant and where all those random ideas came from. Unfortunately, some teachers ask those same questions when they read student essays that aren't well developed, unified, or coherent. In this lesson, we'll discuss how you can develop your argument and write coherent and unified body paragraphs so that your essay score won't be a nightmare. Generally speaking, if something isn't well developed, it means that it's missing something. It's not as complete as it could be, like a fuzzy picture that wasn't developed all the way. With the body of an essay, in other words, the middle paragraphs that don't include the introduction and conclusion, it's important to think about paragraph development. In your writing, the key to developing your body paragraphs is to use supporting details and examples as you discuss your main points. In other words, you need to be specific in your explanations of your points so that you're not feeding your reader vague, fuzzy ideas, but rather clear, well-supported points. For example, let's say that you're writing an essay arguing that parents should give their young children regular allowances to teach them important lessons about money. It would be easy to scribble down a few sentences making really broad points in one of your body paragraphs like money is important and children should know that, children must learn about saving money, and children should learn not to spend too much in one place. These points may be good basic ideas, but to develop your paragraph effectively, you would need to include specific examples and details. So, rather than packing one body paragraph with several broad, vague ideas, you could use each of our three earlier ideas as the main idea in three separate body paragraphs and develop each of those paragraphs fully with specific details and examples. In order to write a well-developed body paragraph on the topic of our first idea, money is important and children should know that, brainstorm specific details to support your point. For example, you might explain that children who learn to manage money well when they're young tend to be better with money as adults. Children might benefit from earning money for doing chores so that they develop a good work ethic early. And when children learn about money, they tend to become more appreciative for what they have, and they may learn the importance of charitable giving at a young age. We know that the word unity has to do with things being joined together, and that meaning applies to essay writing too. For a body paragraph to be unified, all of the sentences in that paragraph should stick to the main idea expressed in the topic sentence. Just like a couple won't be very happy or successful if each of them has very different ideas about the nature of the relationship, your body paragraphs won't succeed if they feature a lot of ideas that don't go together. To achieve unity, you want to avoid any random, off-point ideas. Even an idea that seems to be sort of connected to the main idea of your body paragraph may be taking you off track if it doesn't directly support or relate to your topic sentence. For example, if you're writing a body paragraph with the main idea that children must learn about saving money, then each of your sentences in that paragraph must support that main idea. So you can explain that children can benefit from contributing money to their own college funds early on, and children can learn that it's good to save up for one really nice thing rather than frittering away their money on meaningless things. However, your body framework will be unified, and you'll lose points if you mention that many families choose to rent homes rather than buy so that they don't have to save up for a large down payment. Sure, this last point is sort of related to our main idea in a roundabout way. We're still talking about the issue of saving money and young kids are parts of families, but it's too big of a stretch, and if you include it in your body paragraph, 
paragraph about the importance of kids learning about saving money, your paragraph will stay unified for just about as long as that couple from earlier. You may wake up some mornings knowing that until you get some caffeine into your system, you'll be walking around in a foggy cloud of confusion. After that first cup of coffee, things may finally start making sense. Your essay body paragraphs need to make sense too. To achieve coherence, a paragraph should be clear and logical with sentences that flow together well. So if you have sentences that don't seem to be in the right order, or your body paragraph lacks transitional sentences so that the reader can't see how the ideas relate to one another, your paragraph will lack coherence. Also, your teacher will want to throw his chair through a window after struggling to decipher the meaning of your paragraph. For example, if you're writing a body paragraph on the main idea that children should learn not to spend too much in one place, you'll want to present your supporting ideas in a logical, clear way in order to achieve coherence. You might write about a specific example. Let's say you relate the story about your young child who spent all of his allowance at once and then was pretty unhappy to realize he couldn't afford anything else that he wanted or needed for the next month. To have a coherent body paragraph, you would need to present the points of this story in a logical order. First, explaining your main point that children should learn not to spend too much in one place, and then following with a chronological clear order. You could explain that your son frittered his money away and then couldn't do fun things with his friends later. You might tie things up at the end of the paragraph with the argument that when kids learn this valuable lesson when they're young, they'll be more likely to be responsible spenders as adults. If you jump with your story up, explaining first that your son was mad that he couldn't go to the arcade with friends, and then backing up to explain that he had blown his allowance on way too many jelly beans the week before, and only then remembering that you needed to introduce your main point about kids not spending everything in one place, your paragraph would be messy and incoherent. Also, your teacher would have a broken window and no one sit. So remember to keep your ideas clear and coherent. Some essays come across like waking nightmares for the teachers who read them. But you can keep the body paragraphs in your essay from being a horrifying mess by keeping three basic principles in mind. First, you should write well-developed body paragraphs that use supporting details and examples. Second, strive for unified body paragraphs in which all of the sentences in each paragraph stick to the main idea expressed in the topic sentence. Third, you should present coherent body paragraphs that feature clear, logical sentences that flow together well. You can also ensure coherence by using transitional sentences between your points and ordering your points in ways that make sense. Use chronological order when you relate a story and don't back up and start adding details at one point in a paragraph when you should have included them earlier. By producing well-crafted body paragraphs in your essays, you'll help preserve your reader's sanity and earn high scores. Okay, so we learned about body paragraphs. Yes, Ella. But why was the kid behind a barbed wire fence? Oh, oh was the fence around the fair. But why was it covered in barbed wire? Yeah, that's a good conscious of the wire. Maybe it was to keep the animals from getting out. I don't know. But anyway, so let's keep going. The introduction. So your intro paragraph, you should have your hook or your attention getter. So those of you who just fear edited, you should have been looking for some kind of a hook or attention. You should have probably a general statement about your topic. And then you're going to have your thesis, okay, for your intro paragraph. And what did we talk about last time? The thesis connects to your body paragraphs. Body paragraph one, body paragraph two, and body paragraph three. What am I supposed to include? By the way, this little symbol, if you see it, is, it means paragraph. It's like a little hook with two lines. Um, so in a body paragraph, so I've got to have a topic sentence, right? The topic sentence relates back to my thesis statement, right? Then I'm going to have supporting details and examples. Is that where sometimes my citations might be? Yes. Everybody nod your head. Yes, Franklin's right. And then concluding sentence, okay? Now, would this paragraph only be three sentences? No. no. A paragraph's going to be six to eight, okay? So this is going to be one sentence. And this is probably going to be one sentence. So in doing our math, that leaves me about four right here. So I'm going to have my supporting details, and I'm going to explain how my detail relates back to my topic sentence and my thesis, okay?
right? And you're going to have the same thing for each set, all right? And now we're about to learn about concluding paragraphs, your conclusion, because you've got to write that as well. Yes? The um, body paragraphs are just the same format as the paragraphs we've been writing before, right? Just, you have to um, no, what we've been doing before is a little like the sentence thing. Don't you use the same kind of structure? Um, you would, so the paragraphs we've written before, you kind of had your topic sentence as your intro, and your concluding sentence as your conclusion, and the, the meat of the paragraph was in the middle, right? So now we're expanding those paragraphs into essays. So now, like, your one topic sentence that you've been writing for your paragraph, becomes a whole intro paragraph on its own. The last sentence of the paragraph she's been writing, the concluding sentence, now becomes a whole paragraph. It's your concluding paragraph. And then your middle that you've been writing for your paragraphs now expands into three paragraphs. So you said like paragraphs. intro example one and supporting example one, or example two, do you have like the detail one example, detail two example thing? Yes, okay. right. We talked about like a thesis might have three points. Each body paragraph is going to address one of those points. So like if baseball is, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So um, baseball is a, um, I'm trying to think of an example. I'll think of an example while we watch the concluding paragraph to give you a video. Let me think of a better example. Jamie is trying to convince his parents to let him go on a long backpacking trip. They're not sure he's old enough to go, and he has presented his list of examples of how responsible he really is. And if you let me go, he says finally, I promise I will do the dishes for an entire week. Jamie's been using the very same techniques that you use when you write a good conclusion for your paper. At the beginning of your paper, in your introduction, you wrote a great thesis statement that contained your main points. In your conclusions, you will restate those main points, but don't just copy and paste them. See if you can restate your thesis in an interesting, fresh way. How can you do this? Well, use different words. If one of Jamie's main points is that he is responsible, he could restate the idea by mentioning that he is trustworthy. Use a different order. This can be especially powerful if you want to end on a point that will clinch your argument. In Jamie's case, he tried hard to offer his parents a deal they couldn't refuse, a week's worth of dish duty. Split up the points. You don't need to write all of these statement points all at once. You can write them with some interesting material in between. What kind of material could you use? Add an anecdote. You may already know that an anecdote is a very, very short story. Sometimes a short, wonderful story can move your reader better than anything else. In Jamie's case, he could retell the story of how well he behaved during their last family camping trip. Add a couple of examples. Sometimes you've got to play the everybody's doing it card. If Jamie can point out that some of his most mature friends are going on the backpacking trip, this may finally convince his parents to agree. Acknowledge your opposition. Even though your conclusion is meant to strongly convince your reader to accept your points, you can come across as a real authority if you are willing to mention a few points from your opposition. This shows that you understand the complexity of the issues and therefore sets you up as a good expert on the topic. Here are a few clever tips you can use to convince your reader in your conclusion. Of course, you don't want to use all of them. Choose a couple that will fit just right with your conclusion. Use a quotation. Maybe in your research, you have run across a strong, convincing quotation that fits just right in your conclusion. Jamie could conclude with, Coach Peterson says I'm ready for the challenge. Add a surprise. There may be some element of your research that surprised you. Add that to your conclusion to evoke an emotional response in your readers. 
perhaps Jamie could surprise his parents by showing how he saved up enough money for all his expenses. Use emotion. There's nothing like pulling the heartstrings just a little in your conclusion, especially if you're writing about an important social issue like homelessness or hunger. You could write a sense or two that will reach out to the hearts of your readers. Call to action. Let's say you're writing a persuasive essay, and in that case, a call to action will work great in your conclusion. This means that you challenge your reader to take action in some way. Jamie might ask his parents to call his friend's parents with permission to let him go on the trip. In the case of a paper on hunger, you might challenge your readers to volunteer to help in a community food bank or soup kitchen. Once you've restated your points and used a few wonderful techniques to involve your reader, you're just about ready to end your paper. One great way to do it is to make your main point in a bigger way. Jamie can point out how kids all over the world benefit from the rigor and challenges of backpacking. A paper on hunger could point out that even though there's hunger the world over, we can do our part here and now to help in our community. Conclusion. So, what do you need to write a powerful conclusion? Restate the main points from your thesis statement in a fresh way. Add a couple of important details. Use a few clever writing techniques. Make your point in a bigger way.
One good way to think about conciseness is to think about what, in auto mechanics, is called the power-to-weight ratio. Power-to-weight is the horsepower of the car divided by the curb weight. In other words, the higher the ratio, the more powerful the car. But to achieve a good power-to-weight ratio, you must not only have a powerful engine, but you must also have to limit the weight of the car. Likewise, in writing, it's not enough to have intelligent things to say. You must find a way to lighten what you're saying by using fewer, clearer words. Let's review a paragraph that needs to work on its conciseness. While it may deliver a great message, the ideas of the paragraph are weighted down by inefficient word use. While listening to the paragraph, ask yourself a few questions. Do you find yourself struggling with the language? If you were to rewrite this paragraph, could you make it clearer and more direct? How? In Ernest Hemingway's novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, the main character is a protagonist who, when he's in the book, is trying to blow up a bridge. The main character of the novel's name is Robert Jordan. While he's trying to blow up the bridge, he's learning things about the life he's living. There's lots of stuff. For example, he's learning what it means to love another person other than himself, and what it means to love people in the community that he's living in. The book was published in 1941. As his death approaches, Robert Jordan starts to see these lessons in a sharper perspective, and thinks, even though he's going to die at the end of the book, that he can live a worthwhile, meaningful life. Indeed, it's his knowledge of his death that makes his life so precious. When revising for conciseness, you want to ask yourself two questions about every sentence you've written. First, is the information in the sentence necessary to communicate what you're trying to communicate? If not, simply delete it. If the information is necessary, ask yourself a second question. How can I state this information in fewer, clearer words? Then try it. Count the words in your sentence, then rewrite it with fewer. Repeat this process one or two times, looking especially for redundant information. Gradually, your sentence will shrink, and your conciseness will improve. Using that strategy, let's revise the passage we heard earlier, revision. In Ernest Hemingway's novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, the protagonist, Robert Jordan, is trying to blow up a bridge. Also, he's learning lessons about his life. For example, he learns what it means to love another person and to love people in his community. As the novel progresses and his death approaches, he starts to see these lessons in sharper perspective and thinks even though he's going to die, he can live a worthwhile, meaningful life. Indeed, it's his knowledge of death that makes his life precious. With this revision, we had a total of 54 words saved, which was a 38% reduction. Beyond the reduction in the word count, notice how much clearer the revision reads. None of the necessary information from the original paragraph is sacrificed, and it is presented much more clearly. Polished writing of any kind always exhibits conciseness, which is the quality of being direct and efficient. While it isn't necessary to worry about conciseness on a first draft, it's essential to the revision process. When revising for conciseness, ask yourself two questions. First, is the information you've included essential to what you're trying to communicate? If not, delete it. If it is, ask yourself how you can say it in fewer, more direct words. Over the course of the document, if you hone each sentence in this fashion, you'll cut your word count drastically and end up with direct, efficient writing.